I, I work in insurance and in reinsurance. I'll explain a little bit about this. I know nothing about insurance, so don't worry. I'm come from the geospatial world, so I'm all about mapping and data more than anything else. So hopefully this will in uh, some way be relevant to you, and it's not just an insurance talk. So, so the role that I have inside Swissbury is to help understand whether we're using the best-in-class data to help build the mapping that we need in order to make decisions. And the question I get asked is, what's the best-in-class mapping that we need globally in order to do that? So I'm trying to touch on a few of those questions I have today and, and some of the reasons why. So I, I thought I'd just do this how I would do normally, a little bit about what the insurance is and what reinsurance is, for those of you that probably don't know, because I didn't know before I joined, um, how we use spatial data, um, how we visualise data and where the mapping component of it comes from, and then hopefully um, show you some of it actually how we do it live today. So what is reinsurance, first of all? So the way to think of it is diluting the risk of insurers. So if all of you have car insurance with Aviva and you've all got your cars parked over here and a big flood event happens and all your cars get written off, Aviva are going to take a massive loss. So they say, okay, well, what's the risk of that happening? Can we spread some of that bet? I call it betting and gambling. My colleagues in Swiss Re, some of them agree, some of them don't. And we would say as a reinsurer, what's the risk of that happening? Do we think that's okay? Well, we'll take on that risk. There's not a flood around here. We'll, we'll spread some of that bet and offset some of that. So we need to know what's going on inside the world in order to be able to make those decisions. So why is it important? Like I said, we need to understand what's going on. Um, and there are events that happen, national catastrophes that happen. So I've mentioned on here, events such as Hurricane Katrina. We've heard about that and we've heard of big flood events that happen, how often they happen. If we're aware of all of that, we can help make the right decisions to help understand the risk. And if we know what's going on in an area, you know, crime rates, because insurance covers everything. It's not just about property or flooding or it's about business interruption. It could be about cyber crime. So we have to understand the world in order to be able to help the insurers make the right decisions. Like I said, it's a bit dark. But why is it important? So hopefully this shows up well enough to show what we're looking at here. This is US dollars, billions of dollars per year in losses through to natural catastrophes. And you can see some spikes here. In 2017, there's a very high number of tropical cyclones. So that's cost the insurance industry billions of dollars globally across the world. And we understand or need to understand why these events are happening and how frequently they're happening so we can help build tools for the people making the decisions around whether they want to take on an insurance policy or not and understand the risk better. It's helpful to know exactly what's going on. So whether that be flood, wildfire, as I mentioned on there, earthquakes, lightning, hail, winter storms, these are all natural catastrophes, nat caps, as we refer to them. And to go <laughs> one step further, if you look at, remember, I mentioned Katrina, well, Katrina is a standout storm that happens not very often. And in 2005, how long ago now it was, it seems like only yesterday, but over $80 billion in losses just from that one event. So you can see why it's important to get these things right. And if you, I don't know if you can see the, the orange dots on here, but that's the number of named storms that are taking place over those years. And if you were to draw a line, a best fit line but across those, it's trending up. I'm not going to touch on the topic of climate change and various other things that are happening, but there is a trend and these things are happening more. We'll leave that up to you to decide why. But why is it important? Well, knowing what it can do and the damage that can happen and the disruption that can happen to an individual, to a business, to an entire family, to a property, to a car, whatever, you know, knowing how often that can happen and the severity of it, helps us understand the risk. So, and Hurricane Ian, as I've mentioned on here, one event, 42% of the total losses for that year was one event. So you could have a good year where there's not any severe, really big storms, or you can have a bad year where you've got multiple storms or one big event that comes along that completely changes the game. So arguably, knowing the basics is important, of knowing where things are that you want to ensure. And that's where the mapping component comes in. So let me put this slide up for a minute and explain what this is looking at. Um, obviously, US, 
we deal with global data and a lot of it a lot of the work that I do starts in the US and then when we get it right there, it tends to roll out to the rest of the world. But that's just how the industry works. This is one insurer's portfolio of properties that they insure for, for hurricane. And starting with this bottom right image, the red dots are the locations that that insurer has in their database, in their portfolio, as to where those, lo where those properties are. The green dots are the correct locations. So we were given this portfolio to analyze, to say, why is it underperforming? And what does underperforming mean? It means they're paying out more money than they were expecting. And we went, well, let's have a look at it and see. What do you know about it? Let's look at the location. And has anyone sat down and actually mapped the locations before? Because it's just a spreadsheet. It's just a table of data in their mind. And I did this and presented this back to them and said, these are the corrected positions. And the blue lines represent the shift that you're going to to get the position right. So if you get it right, you stand a better chance of being able to understand what the risk is and you can ensure it. And when you step out to look at an entire city, you can see blue lines transecting across the entire city. And really scarily, when you look at the entire US, you've got one example that goes from Maine to San Fran. Now, you can't get any more wrong than that. And then what was really, really scary is when I, this is one portfolio from one insurer, and I sat down with the insurance experts, because I'm not an insurance expert, and said, this is extreme, right? This is a one-off. And they went, no, no, this, this, we thought this was probably the case. And this happens a lot. And insurers will go, well, the portfolio is giving me this return, so do I need to worry about it? And we're trying to educate them to make sure they understand what the risks are going forward to help them get better. Because better positioning, better geospatial data helps them understand, is it going to be flooded from a, an event that happens? And in this particular case, what is it? 45% of those records were more than nine metres away from the edge of the building, not the centroid, as I've shown there, but from the edge, and some of them were stream going across the country. So we're trying to educate our insurers to get it right. So I kind of summarised it as the things that they need to be able to get right, as the who, what, where, and when. So... If you get the basics right, you can understand what the risks are. So what's going on inside a building? That's the, the who. Is it a school? Is it residential? Um, I have In that same portfolio, they had the occupancy, had some issues where they had one particular address that was classified as um, water engineering works slash dam. And when I looked at the location and corrected it, it was a church. <laughs> So they're making assumptions in the wrong location and based on the wrong who. The what, what's it made of, how many floors is it, what's the roof type. You know, all of those factors are important, especially in the US for hurricanes. You know, is the roof going to get blown off? Is it or the windows going to get broken in a storm? The where, we've already touched on the where, the, they don't know where it is. And then lastly, the hazard maps help us understand the when. So how frequently these events are happening. And then what's the likelihood of them being able to happen again in any one particular location once you've got that right? And hopefully you've got the, the who and the, the what right as well, and they can make a better use. Because that information is rubbish if it's inconsistent or it's out of date or it's just inaccurate. They'll make a judgment based on bad data, and they'll be able to map it badly. So we use this, I've highlighted it in yellow, on here, it models, global catastrophe models, sounds terrible to help us predict the risk of when these events are going to happen in the future. So we use lots of the industry, I want to say we, the industry uses lots of insure tech businesses with clever technology, and they put in loads of information, loads of computing power, and they generate predictive risk scores around when things are likely to happen based on a whole load of information. I won't go into that because I don't understand. But in addition to that, the industry's kind of concluded what it needs to know is what it refers to as COPE. So the construction, what's it made of? The occupancy, what's going on inside it? The protection level, so is it near a fire station, my example there? The exposure, is it in a flood zone? If they know all of those things, that's what the underwriters use to help predict the risk. Going back to my basics of who, what, where, and when, if you don't get that right, you can't get that right, therefore the risk is wrong. And traditionally, they don't use this data spatially, they don't look at it geographically. So moving on, that's our background. Hopefully you're still awake. 
Yes. <laughs> so how are we using this spatially going forward? Um, now, traditionally, and actually still today, reinsurance and insurance is a heavily regulated industry. So it has to tread very carefully in everything what it does. That's basically what that means. And there were controls in place around how we score the risk because you could do it very differently in order to try and win some business or we think it's very low and take the risk or not so that has to all be done and controlled so therefore the data that's used to feed those decisions was for a long time heavily regulated emphasize on the was traditionally up until 2016 all environmental hazard data had to be approved by the world meteorological organization so that was fine. It's great. That means everyone <laughs> providing reinsurance services and insurance services was using the same quality of data with the same plane. We're all on the same playing field, all doing the same thing, scoring stuff in the same way. And it defies these five categories one to five. One, basically, no one's going to die. Five, probably someone's going to die and categorized them accordingly. And they even devised a color scheme red means danger, green means you're fine. So we've got five bands and five colors for all of the environmental hazard data that the entire industry can use to base a decision on. So what's that actually look like? Now, a map, first one. Switzerland, and this is a uh, flood. It's all green, hallelujah, it's never gonna flood. Let's look at a different peril, a different risk. That one's forest fire. Okay, we can see some changes now. We've got some examples of where the risky bits of Switzerland are for forest fire. All very exciting. It's not the best world in that, but you're limited with the colours that you can use and the, and the legends. Let's go back. I've put flood back on by mistake. No, I haven't. I've put rainfall on. Well, it looks the same as the flood. It's all green. Let's try a different one. Thunderstorm hazard. That's also all green. So I can't tell which one's which now. Uh, let's try a different one. Wind, it's also all green. So you can see the problem that was happening here. The industry went, ah, this isn't working. We can't really tell what we're looking at here. Everything's the same. There's not enough categories. The data isn't granular enough. You dictated by how you can visualize it and how you can present it to present a risk. It meant that it just didn't work and that we weren't being kept up to date the industry was falling behind so post 2016 it decided to sort of take action about this and sort of try and change the goalposts a little bit give itself a bit more wiggle room so what it decided to do and actually got approval for was to be able to say yes we can use commercial data we can generate data we can collect other information and that will bring you richer content that's more accurate arguably or precise and we won't go down that road today but there's more content available that you can use and that meant that the the five standard categories weren't really appropriate for this anymore because you've got such a vast range of data it just didn't fit you couldn't squeeze them into those boxes so the insurance industry and the reinsurance industry sort of discovered that actually we need data scientists now to start analyzing this stuff so that we can understand it so half of I'm exaggerating, but there's a big team inside every insurance company which is full of geospatial data scientists now that are putting data together and analysing it to try and make it consistent to make it work. So that's a complete change in the industry. And then what that produced was this very high-level view here of the risk profile. In the old world, using the regulated data, it was a nice even histogram of the risk. And that was fine. Everyone could understand that and it made sense. We started to use this unregulated data with different consistencies or inconsistencies, different values, and it skewed the risk. And the business went, oh, hold on, I really don't understand how to do this. So we needed to change things up. So where are we now? How do we use data? How do we visualize our data? So we've got these issues about this unregulated data and all this different content that's out there, which is great. It's a good problem to solve. Um, different sources with different complexity, different means, different things. But how do we do it? We use, everyone loves a dashboard. No one's really using proper maps. They're all using dashboards and overlaying content on top of it and doing two things. They're either looking at, looking in the past about what's happened or happening today 
and looking at the events of these natural catastrophes, these NatCat events, or they're using the dashboard to look forward and predict what's going to happen. So there's two very distinct things. They're either going left or they're right using this new data. So a few examples, and then we'll look at some of the details of it. A typical dashboard from one of the providers of this type of information. I mean, it's a Google map. Other map bases are available with some symbols on top with a key down the bottom that says, okay, this was, this. you can log into this and go live and there are some hurricanes, there's some flood events happening and you can go down into these things and have a look at the detail. There's clearly a path of a hurricane that's going through here and these are interactive things for the underwriters and the risk experts to look at and they can click on them and find out the name. That was Tropical Storm Harold. This was almost, in fact, it's, it's the date. A month ago today when I took these screenshots, starting to build this up, and as time goes by, these boxes light up or these circles light up with more information so you can look back at the history of them. But it's got a thing on there that says more info so they can click on it. They can see it's a tropical storm. It's got a wind speed, it's got rainfall. There's all these interesting tabs and the one that stands out is maps. And within there are some maps recording some information about that event. And that's, we can do that live. We can look into that software, that web app, that dashboard, and go and look to see what's going on in the world at any one time and see the live events and see the severity of them. And we can look back at those past events and see all that information. And this type of information is what's available to our insurers today to be able to help us do that. That's nothing special. You can download these maps, Noah. This is publicly available. There's an app on your phone called Hurricane Tracker. You can get the same stuff. But it's not particularly advanced. What is more advanced is the looking forward, where we've got visualization plus analysis, as I've summed it up there. So we can look at different layers of data that is all from this unregulated world, lots of different sources. So all these different perils, as we, we refer to them, these disasters that might happen, and we can plot them on a map, and we can turn them on and off, and we can analyze them. However, all of this data comes with some issues. So just focusing on this bit of Europe for a minute, all of these different sources mean that you've got different providers providing the same content, but different way. They might refer to the banding different. They might describe it differently. The resolutions or the aggregation could be different. So you get this inconsistent view of a, an area, in this case, Europe. And trying to do it globally is even worse. So that makes visualization really difficult. One of the other factors that often gets forgotten about is boundaries. Most of these are done by a, a, a formal location, whether it be a country or a state in the US or a region or an economy. So people produce data to, a, to an edge. And today there are 218 areas across the world which are in dispute. So a disputed area for an organization that's trying to create maps for visualization to help us do analysis, to help us make the world better. These are holes in the data because people stop mapping. And in some cases, arguably, there's not much there to map, but in some cases there might be. And there's disputes taking place around some of these boundaries that go on. So a gap in the data set causes a problem. So how can we turn all of that into something sensible? So just go back to our Europe example. Hopefully that shows up right in here, but it's taking all of the official best in class data, because it's the official data, from each of these countries for flood data and sticking them all together onto one layer and producing a map that a insurance company or a reinsurance company might then go, well, actually, we can perform some analysis now. Well, no, you can't, because if you've got an insurance portfolio that's got a location in the UK or even Scotland, England, France, Spain, Germany, they're all different. They're all recording flood and presenting the results of that analysis for us to be able to use in a different way. And you can see I've circled down the end. They, re they refer to the flood in return period, what's the likelihood of a, flint, a flood event happening over a certain number of years. And they basically just smashed it all together. And it's arguably useless, really, at a global level. So we have to turn that unstructured data into something 
sensible structured data in order to make it usable. I don't know how well that's coming out. It looks a bit light from my angle, but that's a consistent view after some modeling and some processing and not just using those source data sets, but using other factors as well. I spoke earlier about those in SureTex with their technology, looking at other factors to help us build a consistent view. So maybe that's the best in class data because it's consistent. Whereas actually, arguably, the best in class data is relevant to the use case. So if you're insuring France, then you only want the French data because that's going to be perfect for what you need. But if you're insuring all of Europe, you need something like this. Or if you're in, insuring properties or locations across the globe, then you need something that's going to give you the globe, which is a problem because there's these boundary disputes. And even with this data, with the computed data that we've created globally, hopefully that stands out, there's massive gaps at the top. Not only are there holes in between that you can't see, but this data doesn't, there's not enough information to compute it globally. So you can't actually get a global view of that detail. So there's a lot of work that's going on behind the scenes to try and make this data the best it can be. So how do we solve this problem with these data models is what I spoke about before. It basically that's taking lots of unstructured data and turning it into something structured that makes it more usable and vis visibly more attractive. Here we've got the raw data on stream. And if I go to the next slide and can replace that with something that, that has been generated off the back of these models, by all these clever data scientists sit behind the scenes, that's a view that's been created of flood risk for that area. And there's one there you might recognize, hopefully that comes out, it's a bit more Paris, earlier one was of Germany. And again, it's not quite as much going on in there, but you can start to build up visualization that makes sense. So all of these previous analysis works that's been taking place to understand risk that have been looking at spreadsheets, we're moving away from that into visualizing the data geographically after having created some of this structured data and building it up. So an example, really, um, we're in Cambridge here. I think, what address am I going to use for this? So I thought, well, I might as well focus on Cambridge and see what we, see what we find. Um, so this is our web application. And you can see the different things I can turn on and off inside here. First of all, I just put on the fluvial flood, so flood from rivers. So that's our view of fluvial flood inside Cambridge here. If I change that to the Swiss Re computed generated version, you see there's quite a lot of difference between the raw data and this other data. If I go back, and if you look up here near Patworth, there's whole areas that are in the raw data that just are not in the computer generated modeled version, which is the better version. So you ain't one of them, it's missing. But actually, if I go back forward to the pluvial flood, which is for some reason they've chosen purple, it's back. So it's been taken out of fluvial, which is river flood, and put into pluvial flood, which is flood from excessive rain. So we've gone and taken it a bit more to another level. And there's a third which is storm surge, which actually is does just about affect this area. I mean, we've got quite a lot of lowlands heading out over that way. And it's happened in the past. So when you put all of them together and then focus in on one particular area, um, I've gone to where I live, just north of here. And if I put a pin on the map, um, then I'm actually in the middle of a flood zone, which is a bit worrying. So my house, I've got them all turned on somewhere in the middle of that map. Um, for those of you that are really interested, my address is at the top. <laughs> and as you can see there, I'm, I'm in the fluvial zones, but I'm not in the pluvial and I'm not in the storm cell. So for that location, we can run this analysis with the green button saying analyze, and it will generate me a nice report that says, oh, I'm in the one in 100 year and the one in 200 year flight. I'm not overly concerned. I don't think I'm going to live long enough to experience a flood in my area. So at a single location, we can produce that risk and produce the graphic, the map that shows what it looks like. And in fact, I can go beyond that. If I turn this next one on, I can do the same for earthquake. Again, very low. 
windstorm, moderate, it gets windy at times, hail, wildfire, lightning, and I can turn on all sorts of different hazard layers that are available once we've taken all of this data and turned it into something structured and built it into the program. So that's our looking forward view, which is taking the sort of event information, turning it into something structured, taking all of this best in class data, arguably, and turning it into something visually attractive to make it use, usable and going forward. So I'm just gonna go through a couple of more examples of where these sorts of things are happening. So this is, you now we've moved to France now. This is property data in France that's been aggregated together based on some certain types and comparing it to other sort of benchmarking in the industry and saying, okay, well, what can we see and how can we work with that? That's all very interesting, it's not that exciting. But when you put the flood data on, that global flood day view that we had earlier, we can now start to see, well, which properties could be affected by the flood and which ones are in which flood return period. There might be a criteria that an insurer wants to be able to use to help understand the risk, all about understanding the risk. And we might add on windstorm as well. There's the windstorm map visual layer as well. So we can see anything yellow or above, according to that legend, is going to be what's it significant through to high and very high. And there's some properties in that area as well. So by applying a criteria to define risk of certain flood conditions, certain windstorm conditions, you can go to the next level and say, actually, they are the properties that, that are in this client's or this insurer's portfolio that meet those conditions, which we advise you not to insure. Or actually, we don't want to help you spread the risk on that one, or we'll only do 5% as opposed to 10%. You know, so helping the insurers understand what the right risks are going forward, but presenting it visually as a map. Whereas previously, this would have been a paper exercise with spreadsheets and the insurers would have just been looking at tables of data going, well, the risk says this. Now they can understand, actually, they've got an issue with coastal properties. It's not rocket science to understand. It's a fairly simple example. But actually being able to look at it spatially helps them understand that a bit better going forward. So that concludes pretty much where I am. Hopefully I've landed in the back oh, in a little bit over. Yeah. Unless there's any questions. Okay. There are some. Yeah. Just, just your last point there. Do you know, is there not a fear if the purpose of insurance is to pool together a set of people and not to distinguish between them, because you're, you're spreading the risk across our whole world. Spreading the risk, yes. So, so if, if you can get down and, and know the individual risk for all the individual people and your insurers are going to say, oh, I'm not going to insure that because it's high risk, isn't that eating away at that fundamental concept of insurance well there are insurers out there that would deliberately say well we'll take on all of these difficult ones and they're okay. specialists at a higher cost because they understand the risk whereas some of the mainstream ones would go actually yeah we, we don't want those we'll offload those and they're all interlinked they all work with each other and say okay let's move those into that bucket over there where that insurer is operating differently and prepared to take on the higher risk properties or vehicles or business interruption, whatever it may be. One more from Warren and then we'll um, So I do a lot of work in the insurance sector. Sure, insurance yes. Um, I seem to have noticed over the years that back in the day, reinsurers always used to be on an aggregates only. The relationship between insurer and reinsurer would always be at an aggregate, like a Cresta zone or something. Yeah, Cresta zones, are, I hear yeah. a lot about Cresta zones. But I've seen it increasingly now that reinsurers are dealing at the you know, individual property um, uh, portfolio through, and you know, and they're doing accurate geocoding just like the insurer it is to really get to understand that. So is that is that definitely a trend that you've seen and are you doing mostly? There's still a lot of aggregation. And geocoding. And there's 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 more um, location level risk analysis taking place and there certainly was and that's the trend that's going forward and we're building solutions to help us you know the the reinsurers understand the risk as well as providing those insurer those solutions to the insurance market themselves at a property or individual location level is certainly the trend that's happening but the crest design is a really good example aggregated data is still very much 
the majority and is easier for them to understand or, and to try and come up with answers for. That's the problem. So we're trying to change the culture of moving to more precise, let's call it, risks than aggregated risks.